My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a Hollywood film and television editor, a documentary director, father of two, and creator of Optimize Yourself. Since beginning my career, I have battled attention issues, anxiety, and creative burnout more times than I can keep track of. Back in 2005, after almost losing the battle with suicidal depression, I decided that I no longer wanted to sacrifice myself for the sake of my career. I was done barely surviving. I wanted to thrive. Since then, I have obsessively searched for every possible way to optimize my own creative performance. My journey is far from complete, but I have now made it my mission to shorten your learning curve so you can forge your own path to greatness without having to sacrifice balance in the process. Now it's time to start designing the optimized version of you. Hello and welcome to episode number 29 of the Optimize Yourself podcast. If you're a first time listener, then I'm grateful to have you with me and I appreciate you prioritizing this time in your day to focus on creating just a little work-life balance and sanity for yourself despite this crazy world we live in. If you enjoyed today's interview and it inspires you to take positive action in your life, I invite you to subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or whatever app you prefer, because I have tons of great guests, giveaways, and free training coming your way on a weekly basis. Just visit optimizeyourself.me slash subscribe to make sure that you don't miss future episodes and to access our index of past episodes. For those of us who spend most of our waking hours sitting in front of screens, i.e. all of us, we have learned a lot recently about the negative health effects of screen exposure, especially when it comes to eye health. And I've seen a lot of activity in Facebook groups in the last few months, especially about eye health and protecting yourself specifically from blue light. I've done past podcasts with sleep experts such as Sean Stevenson and Ben Greenfield about how to get better sleep in part by limiting exposure to blue light in the latter half of the day, and I will provide links to both of these episodes in the show notes if you miss them. But I've yet to have an expert on the podcast to talk specifically about what can be done to limit the health problems that are created by looking at computer screens all day long. In this episode, I chat with Daniel Georgiev, a young but extremely talented computer programmer from Bulgaria who created the software program Iris, which is now an indispensable tool in my toolkit. Now, I've talked about Flux many times in the past, and I've recommended it for years, and I still do recommend it. There's nothing wrong with it. But now my number one recommendation for eye health if you work in front of a computer is Iris. I have it installed on every computer that I own, and I can't live without it. Daniel and I talk all about how Iris works, why he created it, and more importantly, what you can do to mitigate the negative effects on your eyes of working on computers for long hours. Also, if you want to check out a recent TED Talk that Daniel did, I've also provided a link to that in the show notes as well. Now, Daniel was kind enough to offer a coupon code for free activation of either Iris Pro or Iris Mini Pro. And just to let you know, there is a free version of Iris if you want to try it out. But if you want all the bells and whistles and all the sliders and all the little buttons and the features, you need the pro version. But he is offering 100 activations of each of his different versions of his software, first come, first serve. All you have to do is use the coupon code TEAM-OPTIMIZE when you visit optimizeyourself.me slash Iris, and you'll get your free license for the pro version there. Again, the code is TEAM-OPTIMIZE, all one word, all lowercase. Balancing yourself is a fundamental component of the Optimize Yourself program, and I hope that this episode helps you find just a little bit of balance in your own crazy life. Now, if this interview inspires you to take some action, I then invite you to download my ultimate guide to optimizing your creativity, which contains plenty of simple action steps that you can take right away to prioritize your well-being and start sleeping better, eating better, and managing your stress like a Zen monk, because you can't be creative if you are constantly burned out. To download this guide after you listen to this episode, all you have to do is visit optimizeyourself.me slash ultimate guide, and I will send it to your inbox immediately. Before we get to our interview, though, I just want to take a quick second to thank all of you who participated for the last three months in my podcast review giveaway. Now, I didn't quite reach my goal of 100 reviews in three months, 
But to be honest, I got a heck of a lot closer than I thought we would. So I owe all of you, my wonderful listeners, a huge debt of gratitude. What I really appreciate the most is how in-depth and detailed all of your reviews were, and a lot of them literally made my entire day on a regular basis. So I wanna congratulate all of you who won topo mats, human charger devices, private coaching sessions with me, and one month supplies of Qualia. Now, just to let you know, there's gonna be no giveaways for the month of December, but I do plan to bring back these giveaways in 2018, so stay tuned. And now, without further ado, after a brief break to recognize our sponsors, my interview with Daniel Georgiev. To access the show notes for this episode, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash episode 29. This episode is made possible by ErgoDriven, the makers of the Topo Mat and Topo Mini, my number one recommendations for anybody interested in moving more at their height adjustable workstation. Listen, standing desks are only great if you're standing well. Otherwise, you're constantly fighting fatigue and chronic pain. Not like any other anti-fatigue mat, the Topo is scientifically proven to help you move more throughout the day, which helps reduce discomfort and also increase your focus and productivity. And they're really fun and a great conversation starter too. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me slash Topo. That's T-O-P-O. This episode is made possible by The Human Charger a revolutionary new light therapy device made specifically for people who spend long days in the dark and don't get enough sunlight, i.e. you and me. Simply put in the earbuds for 12 minutes a day to receive your daily recommended dosage of UV-free white light. Doing so can drastically increase your energy, improve your mood, and increase mental alertness and focus. This device has literally changed my life and I use it every morning without fail. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me slash human charger, and you can use the code optimize to get 20% off your order. I'm here today with Daniel Georgiev, and I am i hope that I didn't completely butcher your name, did I? It was great. Okay, it awesome. Well, that makes me feel better. We were just uh, talking beforehand about how you are in Bulgaria, and it's 7 o'clock in the morning, and for me, it's currently 9 o'clock at night. So I appreciate you jumping on this call so early in your morning, and thank you for being on the show. Thank you. So the reason that you're here today is because I've had a lot of people in my program that have reached out to me and said, I don't really understand what's happening to me when I stare at a computer monitor all day. You need to get an expert on to help me understand what's happening to me when I stare at computers. Is it blue light? Is it red light? Should I be doing this? Should I be having specific fonts? Like there, There's so many different things behind the science of living in front of computer monitors, which I would I would bet good money that every single person listening to this right now spends at least eight hours, if not more, staring at a computer during the day. And you have a, a lot to say about this topic. So I want to talk about your technology, Iris, but I don't want to get there yet. I first just want to help people understand some of the basic knowledge that they need to know if they're living in front of computers. So let's just kind of start at the beginning and tell me what's what's the first thing I need to know if I'm going to live my life in front of a computer monitor? What should I watch out for? So the first thing you need to know is that it's pretty unhealthy, actually, to sit in front of the computer whole day. But this is our life today. This is the world we live in. And everybody should try to stand up from the computer and look outside from time to time to help relax the eyes. Because when you look, uh, look at the computer, you focus your eyes, they don't move. And uh, this is tiring. This is one of the reasons people start wearing glasses. There are many more reasons, but this is the main thing that uh, people should know from time to time to stand up and look at distant objects. Now, when you say distant, give me like some sense, because I know usually a computer is going to be maybe 18 inches away from your face. So are you talking about a picture on the wall, like, you know, a horizon? Like, well, what's what are some, some good exercises and distances to kind of do on a regular basis? Well, I'm looking at mountains and uh, the uh, objects really distant from me, but everything above uh, 25 meters is good. Okay, so so we're talking about trying to really look off in the distance, not just look away from my computer to a picture that's three feet away on the wall. You're talking about really longer distances. Yes, and yawning and blinking and just moving the eyes and doing uh, maybe not exercise, but just moving the eyes a little because they're pretty static when you look at the PC. 
So if I were not doing that, if I were somebody that just stared at my computer all day long, didn't really look away, and I'm just kind of in that creative zone, over a long period of time chronically doing that, what am I doing to the muscles in my eye? Like you'd say something about that's why people need to wear glasses. But what's kind of actually happening there? The muscles are just tightening. It's a lot more complex than this. The monitor flickers all the time on the backlight. The LEDs turn on and off all the time and uh, the muscles of the eye start contracting. It's like uh, turning the light in the room on and off many times in one second and your iris starts to open and close all the time. It's like contracting, like a muscle. This is what happens when you look at electronic devices in phones, computers and everything. This is why also A-Ink Devices like Kindle are much better for the eyes. They don't flicker, they don't emit light, and they don't make your eye to tighten and loose all the time. Sure. Okay. Well, I, I definitely want to jump into talking a lot about flicker and different spectrums of light. But I guess one question that I want to ask first, and I probably should have asked this as the first question, but I would really love to know a little bit more about your background and why you're so passionate about this because you're a fairly young guy, but you just seem super, super passionate about health in front of a monitor and developing the technology for it. So can you give me just a little bit of background about why you chose to go into this? Yes, so I'm 21 years old right now. I'm the creator of Iris, as you know. And I started doing this because when I was working at, as a programmer in one big company, I had two monitors and my vision was perfect my entire life as a kid. But as I started working, I was working whole day for more than eight hours, constantly not moving my eyes. I just wanted to be really good in front of the PC. And they started burning, really burning. And I started using eye drops at the beginning, um, then a lot of eye drops. I, I remember how my my not wardrobe, but uh, I don't know the world, but uh, it was full of eye drops and eye drop bottles, and it was really bad. I got to eye doctor, he prescribed me glasses, and this was the time that I decided, oh, I, I need to fix this. I, I started looking at all the programs on the internet for eye health, for how to fix my vision, reading everything. So I'm not a doctor, but Iris is really a combination of all medical research and everything I found during the years to fix my own vision. Well, and I'm, I'm a big fan of people that are very upfront about the fact that they're not experts, they're not doctors, but at the same time, I feel like if you're somebody that has had the problem yourself and you've had to solve it, a lot of times you're gonna find more information than maybe even a doctor might know because they get a specific amount of education and information, but you're just going to find everything that applies to your situation that will help you. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with the fact that you may not be a, you know, an optometrist or, you know, a doctor of the eyes because you're somebody who's been through this yourself. Like, for example, if I were, let's say that I were an alcoholic, I would rather learn how to overcome alcoholism from somebody that's overcome it rather than somebody that's read a lot of books about it. And the fact that you just decided, you know what, working in front of computers was really bad for me and I'm going to learn everything I can from all the experts and all the research and then go above and beyond and develop this amazing technology for computer monitors. Like to me, that's pretty amazing. Yes. <laughs> and it's just interesting that the first version of Iris was a program that just locked my computer to force me to stand up. And now this, this timer is also into Iris, but almost nobody uses it. Everybody uses the blue light reduction and flicker-free monitors. But this, this thing evolved for years. It was not like a magic idea uh, during a shower or something like this. Well, uh, as long as we're talking about Iris, then let's just kind of dive right in, because I think that in talking about how it works in the different modes, we can also dive deeper into the different areas that affect us, like blue light emission and flicker and all these other things. So let's just start talking a little bit about what Iris is. So at first, I told you that I started looking at all the programs on the internet. This was programs like Flux for blue light and... I don't work great maybe for a uh, break reminding, but they all 
seemed lacking functionality. Actually, the Flux was the best programmer, but I needed uh, manual control of the blue light. I wanted low blue light all day long because this was recommended by doctors. And I wrote to the guys uh, several times. They didn't respond to me. And I just decided to add blue light to Iris. So Iris at the moment, uh, its main features are blue light reduction automatically during day and night, and also brightness reduction without full suite modulation flicker, which is actually, I think, is the bigger problem than the blue light. Yeah, and uh, I definitely want to talk about that as well, but I really want to get into the blue light first. The reason that you want to remove the blue light is what? What specifically is causing, like, what, how is the blue light a problem for your health during the day, first of all? Well, you know that the light is uh, waves which enter the eye. And the blue light is uh, the wave with the shorter length and highest frequency. So it enters the retina really deep. This, this causes, uh, over the years, macro degeneration and other bad things. And I also understand it after I started talking with a lot of eye doctors. For example, Dr. Marco was, uh, no, he's not an eye doctor, but he was a big believer in removing all blue light also during the day. And the reason is that you need full spectrum sunlight. You don't need just uh, colors. And you need the whole spectrum of the sun. It has really more uh, wavelengths, which uh, we didn't see. But they, they have effect on our skin, on our body, and our biology. And blue light is the, the most damaging of them. And this is the reason we try to remove it during the day. Got it. Okay, so that was one of the first really cool things about Iris that I discovered and made me switch immediately because anybody that's listened to the show for any lengthy period of time knows that I always talk about Flux. I absolutely loved it. Still think it's a great program, but as soon as I discovered Iris and saw there were so many more features and versions and different ways to use it, I said, you know what, let me just try out using this blue light reduction during the day. And it was stunning the difference that it made. Now, there are a lot of people that listen to this that probably do image work, meaning they do color correction. And in that sense, you might have to be a little bit careful with this. But me as a film editor, I'm not worried so much about the exact replication of an image. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna try the blue light reduction. And if anybody were to walk over to my monitor, they probably wouldn't even notice, like with Flux, when you put it in nighttime mode, like we're recording in my evening right now, so my computer monitors are completely red. But during the day, they would be normal. But when you do the blue light reduction during the day, nobody can even see it. But I had one of my colleagues stand in front of my computer just for a minute or two, and I said, just look around the monitor, look at this, look at that, just kind of settle into it. And then I took the blue light reduction off, and they physically jumped back, and they winced their eyes, and like, whoa, that is really bright. So I don't I didn't realize and I don't think most people realize how much bright just staggering blue light is in their face all day long that they can now remove with your program. Yes, yes. And it's actually I don't remove uh, all the blue light during the day. The default settings of Iris are the settings I like and use and my eyes didn't hurt. So it's not like a prescription from the doctor, but you can customize this in the settings. And this is a slight reduction during the day and bigger reduction during the night to, uh, to improve your production of the hormone of sleep melatonin. Exactly. And the, the mode that I was talking about was the health mode. And maybe you can explain a little bit more, you know, specifically what you're doing with the different frequencies, because the health mode is the one I use during the day that makes it a little less blue, but you really can't tell. So what specifically is health mode? So the health mode is basically what I use and what some doctors recommend. Actually, they recommend a really low value of the blue light, but people are scared at first. They don't adapt this uh, this quickly to the recommended settings. And the health mode is something which most people adapt really fast. They start to see the difference and they start to like the program. From there on, they can, for example, many, many sport people, people who do a lot of endurance or doctors use the biohacker mode, which is really red mode, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the biohacker mode is just like this 
crazy combination of all these different settings. So I just put my Iris program into the biohacker mode. And just to step back for one second, for anybody that has used Flux before, it's similar in the sense that it's not like an application window you have to have open. It's just right in your menu tab at the top. So it's really easy to access. It functions in the background. I mean, how much actual space or memory doesn't take up? It's got to be almost nothing. The footprint, I would guess, is very small, correct? For the Iris, the the big program with the UI, it's like, uh, I don't know, 0.5 CPU. And this is mostly the UI. When you close it, the CPU drops. But for Iris Mini and the other uh, things which are only in the tray, only only in the tray, it doesn't use anything back, basically. Exactly. So it's something that runs completely in the background. So all I had to do is go up to my little menu icon at the very top, and I see health mode, sleep mode, reading mode, programming, biohacker, movie, and overlay. And the biohacker one is the one that you mentioned, and that's basically inverting everything, but also making it super, super deep red. And I've done work later in the evenings in this mode, and what I like about it is that I'm able to get more tired and wind down because I'm not getting bombarded with all the blue light, but my eyes don't feel fatigued. And there's nothing worse than a long day in front of the computer or a long evening, and you're rubbing your eyes and you're getting headaches and just the thought of staring at it, you don't want to do it anymore. And the biohacker mode is like the perfect combination of all that. So explain a little bit more about specifically what biohacker mode is doing. Well, it basically removes all the blue light from your screen. So something like this, and uh, it causes more uh, other colors than blue to enter your eye, and they're not so tiring. And then why go to the inversion? And I'm not sure if that's the right word to use or not, but for somebody, like, again, I'm probably not using the right term, but if you were to take a film negative, it's what a film negative would look like, or if you're like in Photoshop or an image program, when you invert it, everything kind of, you know, goes backwards and looks like solar flare. So what specifically is that mode doing for me? Well, in the night, uh, it helps reading black text on white background and invert it. But during, during other hours, you can actually use the sleep mode with the same result. It does basically the same without the inversion. Right, and that, that's one of my favorite modes in the evening. And I want to jump into a couple of others as well. So when I go to sleep mode, is sleep mode and biohacker mode, are those pretty much the same thing minus the fact that it's inverted as far as the color spectrum goes? Well, I tried to add many things to the free version. This is in the free version of Iris, so this is why I added both modes. But uh, in the in the pro version, you can customize basically everything. Okay, and what are some of the areas that I can customize even further? Because I'm using the free mode, and it's already way light years better than the options that you have in Flux. But let's talk a little bit about how much further and how much deeper I can go with some of these features. Well, you can customize the amount of blue light uh, emit from the screen. Uh, you can customize the brightness of the screen to match your room lighting. It's really important to match your brightness to the room lighting. Uh, something like your monitor shouldn't be a light source in the room. It should look like a book all the time, all the day, and all the night. Uh, for example, in the night, it should be really low brightness. If you saw the health mode, it reduces also the brightness during the night. And during the day, there is no reduction to the brightness, but you can reduce it if you are in dark room during the day also. Got it. And why is, I, we've talked a lot about the light spectrum, but let's go a little bit deeper into the actual brightness. When you say that when you're looking at a computer, it shouldn't be a light source. Anytime I've ever been in a room where somebody had a computer, there's always a glow on their face and you could light half the room with their computer. That's just the way that people work. I had no idea that that was an issue. Why is brightness such an issue above and beyond just like the color spectrum? For example, the, the same reason with uh, turning the light on and off and your your eye starts open and closing. Uh, when, the, when the room is dark and your monitor is bright, uh, the, the flicker rate of the, of the monitor and this turning on and off of the backlight, when it's off, it's complete darkness. And when it's on, it's complete uh, glowing to your face. And the contractions of the eyes are much bigger. Uh, for example, 
when if the room was really bright and your monitor was bright, these contractions will not be so big. This happens really fast, so we actually don't perceive it. Our brain is super smart and we don't perceive it, but our eyes feel this and uh, you can test for yourself trying to look at bright monitor in dark room and in dark monitor in dark room to see how you will feel. But the science behind this is actually really simple. The contractions of the eyes are actually bigger and it's like uh, pumping with uh, bigger amplitude. Got it. Okay, so it's it's similar along the lines of when we were talking about trying to look away, go longer distances, short distances. You're saying that because the iris is going to open and close, it's going to be similar effect as the the fact that we're focusing in the same place all the time. Is that correct? No, it will be really high frequency contractions of dying, and this is staring. Uh, it's not like looking close and uh, distance. This is actually healthy. It's healthy to move your eyes and to blink and doing all this thing. I got, okay, got it. I mean, th- this is an area that I actually know very, very little about, which is the whole reason that I got you on the show because I'm a lot of times I'll have guests on here where I've gone much further down the rabbit hole, learning, experimenting. But when it came to monitor health, I was like, I, I really have no idea. I reached out and said, Who's the guy that's going to know about this and have the the best software? And I was led to you. So I'm anything I throw out there that doesn't make any sense, you be the first to say, ah, uh, yeah, that's not right. That's totally wrong, and here's why. So um, I'm I'm totally fine with that. I've got no problem there. So the next question then that I have for you, because I'm basically just been playing with this like crazy. When you go into programming mode, this is like that inversion mode we were talking about. And this is probably my favorite one because it renders everything dark, but your type becomes white. And where I'm confused, or not confused, but what made me think is that I remember in the earlier days of the internet, when I was designing my first couple of websites, I loved doing black backgrounds on white type. Yes. And I was getting a lot of complaints from people saying your website is really, really hard to read. Why don't you just have black type on white backgrounds like all the other websites? So I switched it. But then I started working in this programming mode and typing and writing and basically everything that's white goes black. So you have a black background, a white type. And it was so much easier for me to work and read. So why would people say and why is the Internet standard black type on white when for me it's easier to work and to write and to read when the background is black like it is in your programming mode? So this is why most programmers love actually to, to have this inversion in all our IDs and uh, the program we use for programming are inverted like this. And I'm not sure about the science, but for, for m- many people, it's easier to read and uh, not so tiring to read that way. And for other people, it's uh, more uh, comforting to look at the normal, normal screen. And our people just use it and like it. I, I also use it for programs which don't have a black team. I use it for programs which don't have black team because it inverts your whole monitor. Right. And uh, it's funny because when I do website work and I don't do a whole lot of coding, I know very little about the coding side, but I use like drag and drop themes and things that, you know, web idiots like me know how to use. But as soon as you go to work on like custom CSS, it brings you into a coding panel and the default is black background and white type. And I, and I just, I don't understand why programmers who spend so much time looking at computers and vast amounts of text, if the preference is to do a black background and white type, why everything isn't just like that? Because it's so much more comfortable to look at. Well, it looks scary. It's uh, it's more marketing and uh, this kind of stuff because uh, black and white is uh, the standard. It's uh, welcoming. It's uh, in typography and marketing and all in design. It, it looks better. It looks, uh, for example, you can do 
baby site with uh, this type of <laughs> this type of design, the black uh, <laughs> and white. It will be scary <laughs> for babies. I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. Um, but you're right. Anytime I see like a a movie about computer hackers or you see the deep web or anything, it's always black screens and white types. So that's interesting. But I had never thought about that as you know, kind of being the the scary version. But you're right. That is kind of funny. Where I want to go next, you had mentioned this a little bit, but you had said that so one of the things that we definitely need to talk about as far as eye health and readability is font rendering. So let's go away from brightness and color spectrum a little bit. Let's talk more about font rendering because this is an area that I don't know anything about, but I'm fascinated by. So the one problem I talked about was the flicker of the monitor. And the second big problem is the font rendering to the screen because our uh, you need fast focus of the eye. And uh, the harder it is to focus, the less you will blink. You know, you need to blink to produce tears and to moisture your eye. And uh, during the years, font rendering evolved to look better. But better actually made the font worries. And uh, for example, right now, Microsoft is using clear type and uh, Mac and OS Hicks devices are using font smoothing technologies. And what this does is basically using sub-pixels and uh, the pixel is contains red, green, and blue uh, sub-pixel. And they're using these sub-pixels to blur the font. But if you zoom this a lot, you see how blurry this is. And this makes a die and it's sharp, sharp corners to focus on the screen. And uh, the easier it is to focus the less your eye will hurt. So actually, the ugly fonts or the fonts without font smoothing and subpixel font rendering are better for the eyes. Well, it's funny because all you ever see on, uh, you know, these developer conferences and these presentations is, ooh, look at how pretty our fonts are. And what you're saying is that when they're talking about all their great, amazing design and people are ooing and eyeing, what they're not telling you is that it's actually worse for your eyes and worse for your health. Yes, <laughs> something like this. I'm not sure. Do you use Windows or uh, OS Hicks? Uh, no, I use I use a Mac. So I have uh, OS 10 on my computer, and then I still have iPhone 6. Yes, with uh, Microsoft, with the Windows version of Iris, it's really easy to see the difference because it happens immediately. But for OS Hicks, you need to restart your your PC to see the difference. And I can't show you the difference, but... It's really clear when you sm- switch the font renderings on Windows, how, how the font changes. Got it. Now, is, is that something that you offer or have anything to do with an iris, or is that something that you have to do on the operating system level? Well, iris uh, changes the operating system settings for you, so you don't have to go to... It's really hard for normal people to change this. And this is why I offer it in Iris. Got because I was going to say, I have no idea how to do that on my computer. But if you do it in Iris, I mean, that's a setting that I would love to, to play with more. So, But it's in the pro version. So some things like this I add to the pro version so I can monetize it and make some money because I, I don't work anything else. This is my business and my work and my life. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I admire that very much. That's awesome that you've chosen to, to really put all of your time and energy and effort into this. That's really cool. Good for you. So a, a couple other modes that I wanted to talk about before we get off the show today. These two, I didn't quite understand. And I read the kind of the little blurbs that you had on your website, but I haven't found any use for them. And maybe I'm just using it wrong. But one of them is movie mode and the other is overlay mode. So how do these two modes work? Do you see the, when you look at the program, do you see the blue eye buttons next to the mode and type? When you click it, it opens a description of all these modes. But I, w- I want to explain to you how the movie mode came out. There is a scene from Star Wars, actually, in the in the description. And I was looking at, I don't know, Alien versus Predator or some movie which was really dark. And I didn't see anything. And it was hard for me to focus. I was on my bed and trying to look at the, at the film. And I didn't see anything because of the black scenes. I decided to try to find a way to make the the screen a little brighter and uh, to increase the contrast so I can see things clearly. And this helps with really dark movies like this to see better. 
this is the base idea. I had read a little bit about this. Now I remember where you were saying that, you know, if a computer monitor is too bright, obviously that's going to cause issues. But if it's too dark and you're really, really struggling to pick out details, that's actually bad for your eyes as well, correct? Yes, yes. It should be the something in the middle, as always. Sure, of course, yeah. Moder- always in moderation, right? Yes. Well, just as an aside, one thing that's really funny is that as you were walking me through how to find the little information button, when I put it in movie mode to put it in information uh, mode, I literally jumped back and had to squint my eyes, and I now have a little tiny headache because my computer went from being in biohacking mode, which is really comfortable, and jumping into movie mode, it was just like somebody shining a spotlight in my eye. It was crazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm really so. And the, the reason, yeah, well, it's not, it's not your fault, but the reason that I bring that up again is that generally before I started using programs like this, I would be in front of the computer until one or two in the morning when it was in that setting. But because you're doing it for a long period of time, you adjust and you don't realize how bright it is and the strain that you're putting on yourself. So when I just put it into that mode, it was just like somebody shined a giant flashlight in my face and I jumped back and covered my eyes. And I can't believe I spent over a decade of my life staring at that way into the night every single night. And I couldn't figure out why I could never go to sleep when I was done with work. Now it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, I can't imagine my life without uh, programs like this. I, I re- literally can't, I, I don't know how I have lived before, uh, before founding uh, these things. It's like, Addiction. That's exactly how I feel about Iris now. It's how I felt about Flux. But um, I mean, I, I have all the respect in the world for the people that make Flux, but there, I have no reason to use it anymore because this is infinitely better than Flux. And the one last mode that I wanted to talk about that you have here, and I know that you have the information button, but I want to make sure the audience is aware. Explain yes, to me yes. what overlay mode is. Well, some monitors don't have uh, this kind of uh, adjustments to the screen to reduce the blue light. And overlay mode is something like the twilight on Android is using. It's a kind of overlay to lower the blue light with showing red core. So this is, uh, in the pro version, this is helpful for designers because you can select part of the screen to be able to reduce blue light. And for example, the center of the screen or where you draw, it can be normal colors and everything else, it can be with reduced blue light and uh, brightness. And this is really cool. Wow. So you can you can actually create a mask and say, everything over here, I want to reduce the blue light and make darker. But where I'm actually doing my work, and for anybody that's listening that's a colorist that has to do color work to images, they can like kind of mask out the one area where they're doing color work and see it in the full spectrum of accurate light? That's right, that's right. That that right there is a game changer. I didn't even realize this, what that feature did because in the free mode that I've been experimenting with, when you go to overlay, it kind of looks like health mode where it kind of takes some of the blue light away and you're like, oh, okay, but I didn't, I didn't see anything about it that seemed terribly different. But the fact that you can create a window where you do or don't want this technology, that is astounding. And if I were a colorist, I would not walk, I would run out to wherever I needed to, which was most likely just be your computer, but to install the software. Because the fact that you can create an overlay in a window like that, I had no idea. So that is awesome. Yes. In the free version, the idea is just uh, to support some old monitors or USB monitors, which um, there is no other way to support the blue light reduction. In the pro version, there is also, you can pause uh, Iris when you start Photoshop automatically. You can write uh, pause Iris when Photoshop is started. And every time the Photoshop window is open, your screen will be bright. So this is the second thing for colorists and people who work with cores. Oh, that's great. I was actually going to ask about that because that was the one feature that I didn't see that I liked in Flux is when I was in Flux, it would have a selection of your apps and you could say disable in the following app. So if I were doing work where I couldn't have like the, the red filter or the biohacking filter, it automatically took that off. So that was the one feature that I didn't see here and I was going to ask about, but now I know that in the the full version, you even have that, which for anybody that's a designer or a, a colorist, a lot of which listen to this show, that's huge. Yes, we can actually give several 
hundred free codes after this podcast for your listeners under the podcast to some activation code with, for example, several hundred activations as a present from me to your users. Oh, that's fantastic. How would we do that? Well, I'll just give you the code after the podcast. I will write to do to myself right now. <laughs> oh, okay. That's terrific. Well, I'll make sure that in the show notes for the episode that uh, I include how anybody listening to this can get the activation codes. Because I this to me is a game changer. This is an absolute game changer. And I thought Flux was. I remember finding Flux and thinking, oh my God, this is going to make such a huge difference for me. And I loved it, but I had a lot of very, very frustrating features and it was very limited in its ability to, to change things. And depending on the time of day, it would automatically switch to being brighter, even if I didn't want it want it bright. And this is completely different. So um, I'm, I'm super, super excited to share it with everybody that's listening. Um, before I let you go, is there anything else that's super important that I'm missing either about Iris or that people should know when it comes to living healthier if they're stuck in front of a computer monitor? So we talked about, I'm not sure we talked a lot about the flicker and uh, the brightness, why, why the Iris brightness is better than the default brightness of the monitor. Okay, yeah, let's 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 go into Flickr. You're right. That isn't something that we covered too much. And I don't think many people know much about it because when you look at a computer monitor, you would say, Oh, well, it's not flickering, I'm fine. But then, especially in the film industry, we know that if you shoot a computer monitor and you look at it, you see this kind of rolling flicker. So yeah, let's talk about that. So the problem with monitors is that the cheapest way to control the brightness is to use something like uh, uh, it's called pulse width modulation. And this is basically to, uh, to control the light emitted from the screen. You change the frequency of the backlight. You need really high frequency of the screen to, to not feel eye pain, really high. And when manufacturers and the monitors use this technology, pulse width modulation, this is, and at, at lower brightness, this is causing actually more pain than using full brightness in dark room. Uh, the thing we talked a little bit before, and this is this is the basic idea. So I know the podcast is uh, small, so the basic idea is this. The second thing we didn't talk about is that blue light actually controls our uh, circadian rhythms and our melatonin secretion. Oh yeah, I, w- I would love to go into that more. Yes, uh, you you don't need. Uh, blue light during the day, but it's actually more important to not get blue light during the night. The The most important feature a lot of people like in Irish is that it helps you to wind up faster in the bed. Uh, when you look at blue light during the night, you get eye strain, but uh, your melatonin secretion stops and uh, it's really hard for you to fall asleep. You need maybe an hour without electronic devices to fall asleep. And the thing which Iris and other blue light reduction softwares do is to remove the blue light and helping you to fall asleep faster. Yeah, and this is something that I went into extensively in a couple of podcasts. One with Sean Stevenson, who uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he wrote the book Sleep Smarter, which came out, I don't know, maybe a year ago and has kind of become like the sleep Bible on how to get better, higher quality sleep and be healthier. And we talk extensively about just how important it is to get blue light out of your life, like in every source. We're not talking about just your computer monitor, but even in your house, like any room that I'm in after the sun goes down, I only have red light bulbs. And actually one of the the cool things that I found, and I don't think I've ever talked about this on the show before, I have Bluetooth light bulbs now that I can control with my phone and it has the full spectrum of color. So based on the time of day, I can make it bluer or I can make it redder because I'm so concerned about how it affects my sleep quality. I'll actually be really happy if you introduce us. And yeah, I I need contacts like this. Okay, well, I know that that Sean Stevenson is a huge proponent of Flux and has been mentioning it for years. And if he's not aware of Iris, he needs to be. So I will send him an email and say, you know what, you need to check this out because I love Flux, but I love Iris more. And hopefully he can uh, take a look at it because his audience is going to be way, way larger than mine. But he's a really, really good guy. And I'm sure that he would be able to to help out and uh, would would love this technology. But um, are you familiar with the human charger? 
human charger? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, so I, I just recently did a podcast with the creators of the human charger, and that is actually, so it's basically like a, an iPod Nano but it's for light. So it's like this little tiny device you can put in your pocket and it has the earbuds, but you put the earbuds in your ear and it emits blue light onto the photoreceptors in your brain. So it helps you regulate your circadian rhythms. So you use it early in the morning, especially if you don't get a lot of exposure to light during the day. So I don't know exactly where Bulgaria is on the like the the spectrum of latitude, like if you're in super, super high latitude. But I know that like in Finland, they have entire months where they go without any sunlight at all, which is why they developed this technology. So they would be good people for you to get in contact with as well, because they are all about trying to manage the amount of blue light exposure that you get. But on the opposite end, where they're trying to get you more blue light because you're not exposed to sunlight, and then you're doing the opposite, which is trying to eliminate the blue light at the end of the day. Yes, this is really, this is really good, actually. There are also some glasses which helps you with uh, airplane uh, switching to different continents. And actually, Iris, the problem is that it's really a new project. It's, I don't know, maybe a year after I started it. At the moment, it has more than a million users, but it's really a young project and I'm really young and with not much connections. And this is why the program maybe is not as much popular as Flux and other programs. Yeah, well, I'll make sure to get you connected to some people that can help out with that because I think this is a great, great technology that needs to get out there. So I'm more than happy to get you to the right people and especially the people in my audience, getting them to install this as well because I know that this is a huge thing that people ask me about all the time. And I usually don't really have an answer and I have to say, I don't really know much about computer monitor health, and I guess get flux. That's usually the best that I can do, but now I will be more than happy to refer them to this episode. So on that note, have we covered everything you think, or is there anything left that we need to still let the audience know about? No, well, think about it. I, I, I think you have done many episodes on blue light, so I don't think, uh, I don't think I need to talk about blue light. Maybe some, some doctor can talk a, a lot more. And... Yes. Okay, well, I'll make sure for anybody that may have found this episode first, I'll put a link in the show notes so they can find my conversation with both Sean Stevenson and with the uh, the Human Charger folks. But on that note, I wanted to really, really thank you for waking up super early in the morning all the way on the other side of the planet to have this conversation with me. I'm glad that we connected. I'm more than happy to connect you with other people as well and really appreciate the work that you've put into this technology because it is already having a huge impact on the quality of my life during the day and at night. So um, I really, really want to thank you for coming on the show and thank you for developing this technology. Thank you, Zach. Thank you a lot. Thank you for listening to episode 29 of the Optimize Yourself podcast. To access the various links and resources mentioned in this episode, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash episode 29. If this interview inspired you to take action, I invite you to download my ultimate guide to optimizing your creativity, which contains plenty of simple action steps that you can take to prioritize your well-being and start sleeping better, eating better, and managing stress like a Zen monk because you can't be creative all day if you're constantly burned out. To download this guide 100% free, all you have to do is visit optimizeyourself.me slash ultimate guide and I'll send it to your inbox immediately. Lastly, as a quick reminder, if you want to get your free activation of Iris Pro or Iris Mini Pro, Daniel was kind enough to offer 100 activations of each, first come, first served. Just use the coupon code TEAM-OPTIMIZE when you visit optimizeyourself.me slash iris and you can get your free license there. Thank you for listening. Be well. This episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast was made possible by Ergo Driven, the makers of the Topo Mat and Topo Mini, my number one recommendations for anyone interested in moving more at their height adjustable workstation. Listen. Standing desks are only great if you're standing well. Otherwise, you're constantly fighting fatigue and chronic pain. Not like any other anti-fatigue mat, the Topo is scientifically proven to help you move more throughout the day, which helps reduce discomfort and also increase your focus and productivity. 
My friends at Ergo Driven did extensive testing and compared their product to the top of the line floor mats. And they found that Topo drove almost two and a half more moves per minute with 270% more foot motion. Now, what this simply means is that the Topo users move more. I'm standing on one as I read this, and I don't go to a single job without it. And if you're smaller and you're concerned the Topo mat is too big, or you simply don't have the floor space, there's a Topo Mini for that. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me slash Topo. That's T-O-P-O. This episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast was made possible by the Human Charger, a revolutionary new light therapy device made specifically for people who spend long days in the dark and don't get enough sunlight, i.e. you and me. It's not a light box. It's smaller than an iPod Nano, and it fits right in your pocket. Now, no different than listening to music, all you have to do is simply put in the earbuds for 12 minutes a day to receive your daily recommended dosage of UV-free white light. This light stimulates the photosensitive receptors in your brain, which then affects your neurochemistry via neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline. Doing so can drastically increase your energy, improve your mood, and increase mental alertness and focus. This device has literally changed my life, and I use it every morning without fail. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me slash humancharger and use the code OPTIMIZE to get 20% off your order.